to kind of walk you through what is it, how are we planning to play it, what is the strategy behind it, and such things. So, Peshwa, please take over. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you so much. Uh, and a warm and good afternoon to all of you uh, who have been able to join in. So, uh, as we kind of talk a little bit about our quantum computing approach and our division, I thought it's important to say really what is quantum computing. So, um, according to me, it represents a new paradigm in computation or computing. And um, it really utilizes some of the principles of quantum mechanics to really enhance the present computing power. So, I think this in short is quantum computing. And... Um, it's really a new generation of technology and uh, some of the players have already established uh, you know, what is there right now and what is going to come in the next one or two years. Uh, it has essentially includes the computing uh, power or computer which is possibly a million times quicker than the most advanced computer today. And uh, any of you would have actually read that in, even as uh, way back in 2015, Google and NASA actually reported the new uh, first qubit quantum computer, you know, which could actually solve uh, the complex optimization problems in a few seconds. So, which essentially means that it is actually 100 million times faster than the regular chip. Um, and, uh, you know, they claim that some of these uh, machines can actually solve uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, things compared to a conventional computer, you know, which usually takes hundreds or 200 years to solve in a few seconds. So essentially, it's a huge leap of computing power. And just to kind of demystify it further, I think all of us know about the concept of bits and bytes in computing, present-day computing. You know, quantum computers actually use something called quantum bits. You know, in short, we call it qubits. So, uh, a typical bit uh, is a binary, which means it can be 1 or 0. Uh, but qubit can actually be 1, 0, both at the same time. So, uh, this means, uh, you know, in a layperson's term, quantum computer does not have to wait for one process to finish before starting the other. You know, it can do both simultaneously, and that's why really the, uh, the speed of quantum computing comes in. If I need to kind of simplify it even further, it's, uh, it's essentially, suppose, uh, you know, we want to open 10 doors. Uh, a classical computer now would open each door one by one, whereas quantum computers can open all 10 doors simultaneously. You know, consequently, quantum computer is much faster and essentially in terms of computation can evaluate an infinite number of possible outcomes uh, and permutation simultaneously and react immediately to the changing inputs. So that's how it becomes faster. So this is in a simple way, you know, what, and it's already there, uh, you know, IBM and others have actually uh, have quantum computers which are there and, uh, you know, there are certain numbers which have been stated. Hmm, so this is the first thing I wanted to state. Uh, second one I think is very important is really what are the applications of quantum computing across various domains and industries. And frankly, according to me, there will be, uh, you know, there are applications happening right now across all industries. I thought let me cherry pick a few, you know. Um, for example, you know, what we talk of in the financial industry, finance industry, what we, we call BSSI. Uh, the right mix of investments, you know, based on expected return, risk, and numerous other factors are really important in finding out what will be the optimal return. So, to achieve this, present computers run a technique sometimes called what some of us know called Monte Carlo simulation. You know, and this simulation takes a bit of time. Once quantum computing is out in the, you know, we are really able to use it commercially, these simulator, simulations and complex calculation can be performed in seconds. And uh, even as we talk right now, you know, the, uh, the uh, biggies of uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs are already building teams and investing on quantum computing. In fact, JP Morgan is uh, uh, trying out a quantum computer uh, an option to uh, present system which might offer really JPM a massive rate benefit with complicated estimations, you know, fraud discoveries, etc. So it's actually on, as we say. So this is one of the clear 
um, use cases or use areas. And of course, uh, quantum AI, machine learning, um, you know, if you look at uh, AI and machine learning as one of the areas, you know, uh, it requires a lot of data to function and really realize the potential. Uh, so, more the data, you know, we can really uh, fine tune the process. So, quantum computers are now able to quickly analyze really enormous amounts of data to provide the AI the feedback it needs quickly. And this can be used across industries, really. Um, next one, which I wanted to talk about is, I think, very specific, uh, is in the area of drugs design, uh, molecule design and development, you know. So typically today, in order to develop a drug to cure diseases, scientists need to evaluate a large number of possible interaction between molecules, proteins, chemicals, to see how it really works, both with respect to uh, you know, efficacy, effectiveness, as well as toxicity and many other parameters. Now, this can take a bit of time for these large combinations of simulation and modeling to be done. Uh, but with quantum uh, computing, these multiple com combinations can be reviewed and modeled simultaneously. So essentially, the whole drug design and development process uh, is shortened. So this is a, another very big area. Uh, Cybersecurity and cryptography, one can talk a lot about on this area, but essentially quantum uncertainty can be used to create uh, what we call private keys for really encrypting messages sent from one location to other so that hackers cannot secretly copy the key uh, immediately. Uh, they really, I mean, as they say that if they have to break, you know, quantum cryptography, then they have to break the laws of quantum physics for decoding. You know, so that's why it is really one of the most secure ways of transferring data. Um, the other one is the very complex one, uh, weather forecasting, you know. Uh, if anyone has been in the field of geophysics and meteorology, you will know. Even with today's sophisticated tools, weather forecasting is still a very, uh, you know, kind of, we say, accurate and somewhat of a guessing game. Uh, and all the weather product uh, prediction software apps which we have, you know, are really not fully reliable because, but however, with quantum computing, this whole huge area of data which is there in a weather forecasting system can be analyzed simultaneously Several simulations can be conducted together and uh, thus producing accurate and quicker results. So this is really another area. So, I mean, frankly, there's a lot of areas. I have cherry-picked a few which I thought are kind of relevant. Um, but for us, I think it is more important to really, you know, what we are doing right now is, you know, kind of uh, telling you a little bit of uh, quantum computing areas, uh, applications, uh, in the domain which we are, which is in the domain of ad tech and digital marketing and marketing per se. So if you, uh, if we look at in this area of ad tech and digital marketing again, there is large, uh, you know, usage of uh, any high powered computing, quantum computing. You know, it is from customer behavior recognition to kind of, uh, you know, forecasting of ad results, ad relevancy, even in the question of search, consumer profiling, there's really a large, uh, you know, kind of application areas. And, uh, you know, uh, we at this stage may not be able to say all, but I have tried to cherry pick a few, you know, which I was kind of, uh, you know, which I thought is very relevant and something which uh, we do uh, work on. So one of them is customer behavior recognition. Today, any marketing person or any company, digital company, needs to do a little bit of polls and surveys to recognize and understand consumer behavior. But with quantum computing, there will be no need for these surveys. You know, large amount of data from the internet can really be analyzed at once, sometimes on the go, to really recognize consumer behavior, pattern, and grouping. So things which usually used to take a long time, uh, will be really much faster. In the same way that we use today big data complex and unique user profiles can be created to serve exactly what the target consumers want. So you will actually have much more focused user profiling, targeted user profiling and you know what we have been talking of this term called mass personalization would happen. So finding the best combination of variables for campaigns which is based on projected return risk assessment and other factors Today is a bit difficult, so it can be really fastened for advertisers. And advertisers who, 
use quantum technology to do this computation, definitely expect to see a significant gain in campaign quality while saving time in the process of advertising. So there is a clear correlation which is there. Mm. Next one is advertisement result forecasting. Um, and with this you know, large volumes of data and uh, uh, impossibility of infinite you know, factors, variables, uh, today's present computers will have a certain ability to predict all these changes, you know, certain limited ability. However, with dynamic quantum clustering, a process for analyzing big complicated information to generate projections, quantum computers now will be able to produce very focused and accurate forecast. Again, this is very important from advertising result forecasting because finally all commercial advertising is done with an expected result. Um, the other one I wanted to talk to you about is ad relevancy. You know, um, quantum computing will clearly increase the ad relevancy. Specifically, it can be used to help brands and companies broaden reach without ad spend waste by matching relevant ad to customers and therefore increasing their likeliness for action or clicking or whatever part of the funnel we want to say. And this is again related to the first few that if you have better consumer recognition, profiling, forecasting, you will have better relevancy. So these are kind of only some of the areas in the whole area of ad tech and digital marketing which I am kind of uh, uh, stating to you. And I think there are a lot more areas where really high power computer uh, quantum computing uh, would be useful. Against this backdrop, uh, I also wanted to state uh, really what is our thought and strategy, you know, and uh, for quantum computing. So we believe that for future tech leadership and also to constantly maintain our lead and growth, it is important to quickly build our expertise in uh, sunrise tech areas, you know, which really can bring immense value and competitive advantage to us and our clients. And uh, we have been working on setting up, uh, you know, a state of art technology lab and innovation center in this domain of uh, quantum computing uh, based in US and India. We are uh, working with a team of quantum technology experts from across the globe on this. And this is very important because, you know, today it's important to get the best of scientists and experts. And uh, uh, our charter would actually involve uh, setting up these centers of excellence in uh, quantum technology, artificial intelligence, and developing commercial and business strategy, um, creating an eminent quantum scientist team, and thus create applied AI and quantum AI solutions and products. So this is a clear charter which we have laid down. I also need to kind of put on record that uh, for setting up such a uh, you know, center, uh, su such facilities, it's important to curate a cutting edge team of scientists, which we are doing. Um, world class facilities, physical facilities, uh, some of it you know, actually is the kind of lab interior, uh, steel room as they call it, optical tables, and other cutting edge lab equipment. Um, and there's something called uh, QRNG, uh, which is essentially a special technology of quantum random number generators. So I think there's a whole lot of things which uh, we are in the process and, uh, you know, so that's really the charter and the strategy and uh, this again, uh, according to us, this is a cutting edge domain, you know, extremely exciting for uh, all the tech nerds and of course all of us uh, and uh, with uh, really immense potential of innovation and uh, which we believe and I believe could give us the competitive advantage and uh, growth, uh, future growth. You know, so uh, that's what I have to say really. And uh, with this, I would like to hand over to our CNB, uh, Suresh. Uh, Suresh, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you, Peshwa. Thanks a lot. That was fantastic. I I really enjoyed uh, getting into the details of it. Very good summary. Uh, just I want to add just a few lines uh, with your permission. Uh, the essence of it, while it sounds uh, highly technical, the essence of it, what from a business perspective, what we're trying to do is, already we do close to 90 billion impressions on a, on a very you know busy month of advertisement. 
across our network. So that, what does that mean? We create a lot of data in the back end. And we use that data to improve our ability to run better ads. So this happens. Now, this particular technology will put us completely on a different uh, orbit in terms of how do you deal with the data that comes to you. Specifically, the point that uh, Peshwa brought out about those 10 doors where you're trying, if you want to find somebody, you're searching for somebody who's hidden amongst the 10 doors, you would go door by door and search, which is the old traditional way of doing it. Through quantum computing, I could directly go to the place much faster to the place where the guy is hiding and find him, search him out. So these are some of, I just give you, these are some of the clues for you to understand what we are thinking in terms of how it will change the entire way of, you know, doing business. So we are very excited about it. We think this will uh, give a very solid edge to, to the business and to our technology, which will, uh, you know, result in better revenues and profits for the company. That's the broad uh, idea on quantum. I will continue on. We'll talk about the next point and then go to questions eventually. So please hold on to your questions and then let me go to the next item, which is further details on the announcement we made with respect to Media Mint plan. So if you really look at it, see we announced this uh, deal uh, with Media Mint back about, uh, you know, almost about, you know, eight months ago. And uh, this, this particular announcement has caused a lot of questions and people are wondering what happened, why did we do it later? What changed from when we signed up to now? Did we change our mind? Did we go back? Was there an issue with due diligence? There's so many questions that are popping up. So I think before, uh, I will try and answer all of them uh, so that we minimize the number of questions we can we need to take later. I'll, I have the list of questions in front of me and I'll try to address that. So, you know, most important is, let me first explain the rationale behind why we did the pyramid deal for Sitecom. Given that you know, first of all, we got out of uh, all the debt. We became debt-free in 2021. And then we were now poised for growth. You have seen that growth last year. So we are now ready to scale the business, both using organic and inorganic routes. So we anticipated, plus there's been a huge surge in terms of the overall number of users, number of computers, number of uh, laptops, you know, number of phones, Everything has gone up so much. So with this in mind, we, we are going to see a huge growth in the business. And so we wanted to be ready for it from the back-end perspective. The front-end is good. Our guys will go and sell, but we have to deliver. We have to really enhance a lot of things to be ready for the new Brightcom. The Brightcom of 2020, Brightcom of 2021, Brightcom of 2022, and Brightcom of 2023 will all be different. And what we have seen as a, you know, a linear growth would be very quickly changed into an exponential growth when you go past 2024 is what we are envisioning. So to be ready for it, we felt first and foremost thing is to set up a proper backend. Make sure that this is a backend that can scale. So with this in mind, we, we said, let us now look at an inorganic route. Yes, we have an organic way of going. But our focus is more on the front end because we are getting the clients to solve their problems. It makes sense for somebody to scale back end in the same way. So in that sense, it was a very large problem. For various reasons, of course, including their presence in the same city we operated. They have, you know, they have scaled. They have been the back end. Uh, business for uh, multiple publishers, <laughs> agencies in ad tech, and they have helped them all scale. So they have a, a method to the madness. So we decided to join hands with them, and this is clearly an inorganic way to add capability in anticipation of large growth in business. That was the thought process. So now, as the deal progressed over the years, as you all are aware, the industry grew phenomenally last year. Both the companies independently grew more than two times 
our business grew by two and a half times in terms of revenue. Valuations we were oh, telling that the valuations have gone up significantly from where we are. That's it, aside. In terms oh, of our yeah, own yeah. business, so this led to a lot of you know, and then we oh, went God. ahead. Everything we went through the due diligence process, went through the agreement negotiation process, and then we were since we're a listed company, we have to go through all the approvals from shareholders, from you know, exchanges and all the regulators and such. So this process went on. And during this process, we have oh, seen okay. both the businesses grew more than what yeah, we anticipated yeah. last year. Well, you know, we we always want more growth. So we we growth. And we started to, so there is no okay. change of heart. Okay. The okay. core of them, we said, let us relook at the deal. Both yeah, yeah. We said, okay, yeah, what yeah, is yeah. it that Brightcom wants, what is it that Media Meet wants? From Brightcom ah, perspective, we yeah, wanted yeah. to have a yeah, solid yeah. line, which is what I just told you. Yeah. Now, coming to yeah. Media Mint, yeah. Media Mint yeah. is trying yeah. to grow their business, and they, this is a good way to yeah. scale up, of course, yeah. in, in a way, giving an exit to their yeah. promoters and such. So, so this was yeah. both the, uh, you know, this was how the deal was concepted. Yeah. Now, yeah. if we rework this, even that the whole context is changed, the world is changed, the cycle of business has changed. If we rework this, where both objectives are missing, and it may be a best way to go forward is what we concluded post this. And this only happened in you know, the last few months. So we said it makes sense. And some of the advisors who come on board, also advisors, you should look at it because it makes sense to conserve cash for doing something else because you're only enhancing the back end. So that was another point to be taken into account. So here there are two ways to go ahead. One is to complete the full acquisition of the company and take complete control where we have every control on there, how the entire strategy of Media Mint goes from here on. It could be a subsidiary of us. Second is rework it into an alliance where our objective back end is made, their objective of growing their business and growing their valuation is met. So both are met. This was a win-win solution that we felt. So I want to emphasize this is not something that happened you know, due to some issue. It was more of a, a rework of a well-thought-out plan to meet the inorganic need of right So this is what is the Clarification in terms of gives you a little more context to why and how this deal was put together. Now, again, given this, there are a few questions. I'll try to go through them one by one. They said, did we decide to cancel the deal? We did not cancel the deal. It was reworked into an alliance. <coughs> did the forensic audit play a role? There was absolutely no role, nothing to do with the forensic audit in this. What happens to the shares allotted to the media mint promoter? We are going to initiate a process uh, in the next month or so to to annul the issued share. The the shares, I think they have about uh, 2.4 crore shares or so. I have exact number is not top of my head now. So we will have to go through first file with the exchanges, then get the approval of the regulator, then file with NCLT to annul those shares. So it will shrink uh, our entire, uh, what you call, number of shares of the company by that amount of shares. So in a way, it's not, it's not a bad outcome. It's a good outcome. So then comes the question about, okay, uh, what is the, okay, the other questions that did pop up, by the way, is what are you going to do with the money and such? And obviously, uh, we have large plans for the growth of the company. We have enough and more ideas on how to use that money effectively to bring maximum value to the growth of the business. So there is, I'm not concerned about how to use the money at all. And uh, there's been questions about, okay, what about uh, the audio advertising company that we talked about? And there's some, somebody is asking about, what is the target company name? <laughs> we are getting close to it. So actually, that is the reason I requested Satish and uh, Satish Chiti to be on the call. Uh, so Satish, as you know, is uh, geared up to take over that division, and he's been driving that acquisition for us. And I'm very, very uh, thankful to him for doing a great job 
in keeping it all together and making it work. Because <coughs> given that it is in the U.S. and we have to go back and forth, he's done a fantastic job. Satish will give us a quick update on where we stand with respect. This is beyond our original agenda, but I, you know, please allow me to, you know, get a quick update from Satish. Then we'll go for Q and Satish, could you please take over? Okay. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, again, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us on a Saturday. Um, just like Suresh said, I just wanted to give you a quick update uh, on on the Brightcom Group Audio acquisition, and uh, I'm very excited to do that. Uh, as you're aware, Brightcom Group earlier announced that we signed a letter of intent to acquire all the assets of a U.S.-based digital audio firm that owns and operates multiple assets for total consideration of about 102.5 US million dollars. Um, uh, the target company, as some of you are again aware, is an integrated digital platform um, that offers several, uh, offering several program radio stations, various digital brands, and also digital marketing services in several markets in the US. Uh, this move will mark a significant, significant entry for Brightcom Group into the fast-growing digital audio advertising segment. Now, for our current status, um, over the past six months, I think, like Suresh said, there's been a lot of back and forth to the U.S., and there's a lot of activity that's been going on. Um, we've completed the financial due diligence with the help of uh, Ernst and Young, um, We've also completed the legal due diligence. We've utilized two uh, uh, law firms. One is Lerman Center. It's a Washington, D.C., U.S.-based law firm, and Tempers, uh, which is an Indian law firm that we traditionally have been using um, for all of our activities. So they worked in concert uh, to successfully complete the legal due diligence. Um, we've also completed the operational due diligence in terms of their assets, and including environmental assets, assessment, which is a key thing in the U.S. Um, and we've also completed all of our facility visits uh, by our team, uh, basically I, uh, including myself, uh, Brad's team in the U.S., um, and uh, Suresh himself uh, was kind enough to join us uh, for some of these facility visits. So we've actually visited all of our facility, all, the, all their facilities, and uh, ensure that we dotted the, you know, all, all the requirements that we have. Um, and then um, negotiated and closed the key employment contracts um, that are very critical for us to then go ahead and sign a purchasing agreement. Uh, we are fully satisfied uh, with the above findings um, of all these due diligences that we have done, uh, and it's in line with or better than our expectations going into the deal uh, in the beginning. Uh, the company itself is, uh, is still ahead of its 2022 calendar year financial forecast, uh, both in revenue and profitability to date. It gives us a lot of uh, comfort and reaffirms our confidence uh, to move forward. Um, so the critical thing, the definitive purchasing, ag purchasing agreement is almost in place. Uh, barring one key clause that we, have been, uh, we are trying to uh, get agreement on, and I think we are fairly close, the rest of the agreement has already been agreed to and uh, completed. So we will make an announcement as soon as uh, we sign the definitive agreement. Uh, once we sign the definitive agreement, as I indicated on my last update as well, we need to initiate an FCC approval process. FCC is the Federal Communications Commission in the U.S., which is very similar to the Indian Communications uh, Department as well, that has to approve. Uh, any any deal in, in this uh, audio segment. So, again, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity, but I think uh, uh, over the last few months, we've done um, some good amount of work, and I think we are pretty, uh, pretty further along uh, in terms of uh, completing this transaction, which I think is going to be a, a really good um, uh, area for, uh, for us to enter into. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you, Satish. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, operator, can we get into Q&A? Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star and 1 on your telephone keypad and wait for your turn to ask a question. 
If you would like to withdraw your request, you may do so by pressing star and one again. I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star and one on a telephone keypad. First question comes from Suprit Prabhu, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello, good evening, Suresh, and your entire team for such an excellent initiative to go into the next generation of computing with quantum computing. We truly understand Thank why you. the media the deal was cancelled, I mean, which was reworked. Now, uh, what I saw is we have a lot of cash in hand. And uh, as you mentioned, we were very fortunate to be a part of the MSCI index, you know, small cap, mid cap, the BSC, NSE indices. Now, one of the things of the indices is if your market cap falls below a certain level, then you come out of these indices. And, you know, that would automatically trigger the exit of a lot of, uh, you know, foreign institutional investors and including domestic institutions. So now that we have a cash on our book, why don't we go for a token buyback or something to, you know, lift up the sentiment among the investors? And, you know, it can be just a token amount, but then it will give a lot of confidence to the present investors and it will stabilize our market cap and which will, you know, help us to remain in this index. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Supreet Prabhu. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a doctor. I'm an ENT specialist. Yeah. yeah. I think I've seen your tweets also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you for 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 your confidence in the company. Uh, so your question is very valid, and you know we have got a lot of suggestions uh, on the same line, talking about why don't you do a buyback, and you know there is a additional fund. See, the idea of raising funds was not to buy back. It sounds illogical to me that I go raise funds and then go back and buy back. So it sounds like some sort of a scheme to kind of put the share price up. That was not why the funds were brought in. So we brought in the funds with an object of growing the business. So that is my take, and I'm not saying I'm close to any ideas, but this is where my mind is right now, <laughs> Dr. Prabhu, because I think we have raised the funds, and so at various levels, now we want to use the funds effectively to actually grow the business. And yeah. we see the opportunity bigger than the funds available that can do. So it's not like I have yeah. additional excess funds, except yeah. that there is a saving with this particular transaction, yeah. There is not uh, much of a challenge, as much of an issue on exactly how to use these funds to grow the business. So we we think, you know, it may not be the most efficient use of capital to go back and, uh, you know, start buying stock up. I, I don't think that is appropriate, but we will evaluate as a board and we will take a call on that. The, the, only, the, on, yeah, yeah. the only, only fear is it, you know, the leading to the fall in the market cap, leading to, you know, us coming out of this, you know, reputed indices. That is the only issue. And now that we have saved some amount from the, I mean, and we have that cash in hand, it is just a token to build up the sentiment of the investor value. I mean, sentiments of the investor. That is the only concern. The falling, coming out of these indices, important indices. And thank you. Thank you for leading the company. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next question comes from Jamin Sony, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Thank you for uh, giving me a chance. Uh, Thank my you, question Jamin. is, my question is uh, related to today's conference call, and is how much time it takes to set up and uh, start working for next growth uh, with quantum computing. Uh, are we uh, going to develop bold new lab for set up a computer or uh, only uh, thinking for uh, creating algorithm to execute a quantum computer? Excellent question, actually. I will try and address it, then I will also let uh, uh, Peshwa is more into it. But at this point, I'll give you a bird's eye view and then hand off to Peshwa to add to it. The way we have approached uh, investments into products or uh, product development, platform development, or you know technology investment has been as follows. So there are two things. One is to sustain the current business. You have to keep up with the changes in the marketplace, changes in technology, 
changes in consumer behavior. So taking these into account, we always have certain investments that go into keeping the revenue as it is, or at least keep a steady linear growth. So that is the part of our platform development process that goes on across all our subsidiaries, which is what you know I've talked in the past. So that is one option. The second one is three to five years. What is it that we should do? So there is a strategy group that we sit down and we try to figure out where is, and we take feedback from the guys on the ground, meaning people in the marketplace, sales guys who go out there, meet the clients, understand where that is moving. How are they thinking? So all these points are being taken into account when we invest into the three to five year uh, horizon. Then comes the really drastic idea. So we had done a similar one uh, in the past. For example, two such things. I'll give you examples. One was successful and one was not successful. So I'll give you examples of that. So I don't want to set wrong expectations. Uh, so hence, I want to give, be very open. And uh, this is quantum computing is a brand new new area. So there is no precedence of quantum computing coming into you know digital marketing and becoming a, a main part of thing, the main part of business yet in our space. Yes, Google has invested in the same way that we are talking today, looking into the future. And, you know, when I talk about this uh, Peshwa's example of 10 doors opening and one door opening, it completely fits for Google because they're a search engine, which is, is all about searching. So it's just, this is just one example. So there are so many things that can come out of what will go on here. Now, the question is, are we going to develop hardware? No, I'm not trying to build a quantum computer. I'm trying to use quantum computing evolution and understanding of how the how the new uh, systems work in order to develop algorithms to make my product and make my solution smarter and have a massive order. so that is the thought process now time wise i cannot tell you is it uh, it is definitely not a short term immediately business growth investment we may help it may help because we are working on it it may help position us because they may, we may be seen as a more tech-driven company, so it will help us do a better job at selling. But more importantly, the use of how this work, how this actually helps the business, helps a platform perform better, you might if you might start seeing some of it maybe, you know, one, two years from now, because we are just putting our, uh, you know, getting our feet wet, as they say, just trying to get into it. In fact, I wrote an article on this personally. You know, I've actually tweeted this about in 2018, I mean, that was really early stage. So I do, you know, we as the management, we try to be abreast of what is happening. But since then to now, I think a lot has happened. Okay? And we feel it is time for commercial guys to start utilizing some of the power that brings to the table. So I'm sorry for a very long answer, but that is the thought process. I hope I've answered okay. your question, Jamin. I'm happy to say that. Almost sir. Hello. Mm -hmm. Another question yeah. is how how much uh, it requires of funding for uh, almost for of course uh, for next uh, one or two years. Uh, the broad uh, estimates we are still putting together. I will share that with you. Right now we have decided to enter the area. We will try to get a sense. Uh, like Keshwa said, you know, we are talking to some of. I think the cost is research cost primarily. A good talent is what it is going to be and maybe some cost for a lab which is absolutely required to test out the idea so it will not be heavy investment but obviously it's a long-term yield investment so it will not in fact majorly it will not have a huge impact on anything to do like that one last question uh, one last question uh, which is out of context uh, for the today's meeting today's call can I ask you? No, you're not allowed. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I wanted to ask those questions for a long time, but uh, couldn't get chance for it. So, uh, yeah. We want uh, information on uh, shareholding pattern for uh, promoters of the company, Mr. Suresh. Uh, of, of course, we and Mr. Vijay Kansala. So, after the uh, equity dilution, 
you know, I mean, Mr. Vijay has holding of 9.03% and 7.45% respectively in quarter for FY22. Okay. And in quarter for FY22, uh, uh, subsequent quarter, it reached to 0.86 percentage and point and 1.6 percent respectively. So, how the transaction was executed? Okay, good. I have answered this question in the past. So, but let me ask you a question because I know <laughs> it's kind of a hot topic. People love to talk about it, and they think uh, promoters have no money and things like that. So I won't get into that. Important part is. December, what was the shareholding? Uh, 2021. And, and what was the shareholding? Uh, end of March, and what is the shareholding? End of June. If you look at all, it has remained constant. Whether it is on my name, whether it is on a company that I own, that is not important. Okay, now that said, okay, that said, you're pointing fingers at me saying that have I sold the shares in the last one year when the share price was high. I have clearly said I have not even sold one share. Okay, this is an issue that we have to work directly with the regulator. Hence, I am not able to talk much about it. So, please do not misunderstand and don't take it, get into this, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, into this uh, unnecessary rumor mongering that the promoter has sold and made uh, a killing during the share price up. I can guarantee you one more time I have not sold even one share in the last one year during the peak at all. Okay, so that is what I have said and I'm going by it. And we have submitted the information to the regulator. Regulator is looking through it. It is, there's nothing, no wrongdoing here. There's no point beating it again and again beyond a point. Okay. So actually, I'm a, okay. I'm a stakeholder of Brightcom since 2017. So I have... Uh, uh, good trust on management also. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question. Yes, sir. Next question comes from Anil Ranbani, Ascentum KPS Private Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, namaste. Good evening, sir. Namaste. Namaste, Mr. Uh, Dhoni. Go ahead. Uh, sir, I, few days back I was uh, reading about our company and I came to know some interesting names like HK, Baldwin and uh, Ono Magic. So, so, sir, my question is, uh, do we have any kind of ownership or investment in this company? Uh, what are the names again? Can you please repeat? I could hear. Ono Magic. Ono Magic. Bolbin and the last yes, one yes. is HK. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, ono Magic, we own uh, 51%. Okay. okay. Boldwin, um, I'm not sure how much the stake is right now. We do have a minority stake. I'm not sure where that stands. Third one is Edge Case. Mm -hmm. Edge Case, uh, we have, uh, yeah, the reason you are bringing it up because uh, we were working with Edge Case for the AI part, we have, they have been a collaborator with us. And in fact, one of our key uh, management team uh, guys are part of that in terms of trying to develop that as well. So that is a conversation yet in process. They have been offered a stake there. We are working on that. So that is not yet complete. So this is the broad idea about these three companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, then. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question comes from Ashok, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Ashok, an individual investor. Yeah, good, go afternoon. good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. My Mr. question Ashok. is, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, there are two questions. The one is about technological obsolescence. Uh, what steps you have actually taken to, I mean, if tomorrow a uh, new thing comes out and uh, this backfires, the total investment, what kind of uh, fallback arrangements uh, can have? And the other is, uh, I mean, the, in terms of investment, uh, where we are, we, we can lead to that in terms of share price from here to. 
Okay. Let me try and take both your questions one at a time. So technology obsolescence is the is a, what you call what people ask most of the tech entrepreneurs what's your worst nightmare. <laughs> so <laughs> when you ask yeah. even the head of Google or uh, head of Facebook, he will not have a better answer that that is always a risk that technology has. There is always an opportunity. Something may come and he may go out of. Uh, let me throw your business entirely out of. Yeah, so that yeah. is part of it. So that said, that said, what are we doing? So what do what we have done over the years is there is always a continuous investment year on year on enhancing current platforms or developing new platforms. Over the years, if you look at our you know our list, our report, our report repository of platforms that we have, you will be surprised there are close to hundred platforms we have built since inception of the company. I'm talking about from a knowledge tree, from an IP rotator. There are so many things the team has continuously built to stay ahead or to be abreast. Like they say in ice hockey in the US, they talk about it, right? Uh, yeah. There is this great player called Wayne Gretzky. I think you forget his last name. So he they, he was asked, how do you know that you how, how do you play so well? He said, there is always a player in the team. Others are all chasing the puck. Puck is like a ball, right? It's a black disc and everybody is chasing the disc. But this one guy somehow knows where the disc will come. And so he's there ahead of the time and then he can score. Which is the core of any tech company. We are trying to find out where the puck is going to go. And hence, such investment. When you're looking at future, you're looking at where is it trying to go. There will not be absolute clarity, obviously. There will be haziness, but... As somebody who has worked in technology, who's got a tech background, who's got all all the you know teams that have worked in this, we take calls on which area will develop. And I, I was just telling the other caller about it, and I think I missed completing that. We did two initiatives. One is we did Lycos Life, which was way ahead of time. We did something called Lycos Life, which is a band which does health. And today, of course, there's a lot of things that have come, but we did a little ahead of time. We had a few ideas. And that didn't take off, not because technology was wrong or our fund was wrong. Our ability to get into B2C and trying to build a B2C business, that whole mindset of us being a B2B business came in the way of getting that successful. Similarly, in 2017, we launched a product called Brightcom. And this was in, specifically, we were seeing video advertising growing and we were seeing a lot of uh, automation of how the bidding process was happening. So we were amongst the earliest to come up with a programmatic solution called Brightcom. At that time, the company was called Lycos. But this product has been by far the most successful product we've ever had. So this was anticipated almost two years before the market, and hence it put us in a market leadership position. So we have to take these continuous small investments to stay ahead and to actually uh, win over the, to figure out where the puck is going to land. So that is exactly what we are trying to do with occasionally seeding some technologies, not over investing, seeding some technologies to be ready when something, when we see the industry moving there, we are already there. So that gives us an edge. So this is the thinking behind how do you make sure that you as a company don't go up in terms good, of good. Uh, income. Good. Like that. that is the thinking. This will give you a size advantage as well. Yeah, everything, everything else follows. As long as you, yeah. you protect yeah. your business, yeah. everything else will follow. It has. Suresh, this is Peshwa. What about the, sec yeah, what about the second yeah, part? I didn't let you talk about Yeah, please, please, your, your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Your turn, Peshwa. Uh, can I add in something, Suresh? Yeah. Please, 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 please. Okay. So, uh, because today we have been, you know, giving this example of these 10 doors, I wanted to give that example in a tech context, that in any technology, you actually need to keep on opening multiple doors, you know, and uh, you cannot just open one or two doors. So, I thought I would give that example, and you already touched okay. upon it, so I just thought I'd tell you, I mean, kind of for the audience, I would say that. Yeah, that's, I think it's... Uh... A good example too yeah. because good one, uh, yeah. It's related. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, joining it. Yeah.
Thank you, sir. Next question comes from. No, my from second part, second, second, second part is uh, pending. Where, okay. where we are uh, thinking of leading this uh, to profit additions and all in the. I think I answered that, right? It's the same thing. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. It's called. Yeah, I think I answered that in terms of you know this, this yeah. is how the approach, the mindset of a tech company is that tech product company has to be led for you to win. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question comes from Swami Nathan Chidambaram, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Sir, only very simple. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, we have we have the proposal to acquire that uh, audio company, which is estimated to yes, cost sir. about two hundred and twenty million dollars, sir. I want to know what is the source of funding. How will you uh, finance that? Whether it will, you are going to use the, the surplus cash available now or uh, bank loan, or how how will you raise the funds to for that acquisition? Okay, okay. Partly from the company. Cash, uh, free cash flow, part of the funds that have been remained, and partly it will be a small dilution on the stock. So yeah. this is the combination. Dilution by any of the right issue or uh, uh, how? No, we will give them a share. We give them share. Okay. So if you look at the, if you look at a hundred and two point five million uh, size. About uh, I think uh, Satish, you have the exact number. I think it's about ten million or so is going to be in stock. Why don't they consider ratio? Why don't they consider a ratio issue, sir? Uh, this is where this is where our mind is, but we will see. We will see. We have come to that point yet, so we will see how to do that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Next question comes from Atif Shah, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, well, first time asking hi, a question. Hi, Thanks, for your, Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so, I mean, most of my questions have been asked before in this uh, by other people, but I mean, a long-standing question, forgive me if this has been asked before, so I might have missed it. But, uh, so, there's a lot of, uh, you know, negativity in the market about subsidiaries not being audited, numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you mentioned in your last phone call that we are working towards improving our corporate governance and you're recognizing it as the third pillar and you'll be taking steps towards it. So um, my question is, why not have one big auditor like, you, you you mentioned Israel and the top four, like the big uh, revenue drivers are like audited by ENY in the top four. So why not have them for everything? Like that would really help. I mean, it would dispel sure. everything one thing for all. So we we have evaluated it. Uh, uh, we are trying to avoid or anything. Just a lot of times we grew the business through inorganic route. Uh, when you, in the early days, so each one had a local presence. They had local vendors. We did not interfere with any of them. They had their own people they were working with. And I uh, know, in fact, when we acquired uh, Oridian, which is now the Israeli company, OMS, they had the EY at that time as well. So we talked to EY in it uh, to see if they can be our auditors at the consolidated level. And they said they cannot do consolidated uh, standalone and consolidated for the parent unless 70% or 70 or 75% of the uh, company's uh, subsidiaries are audited by them alone. So that was getting challenging because some of us, some of our uh, entities are small entities sitting in uh, South America, some are in the US. So, you know, it's something that we have been looking at and not executed yet. Definitely, we will consider that. You're talking about corporate governance. Absolutely, there are so many things that are we are looking at with a fresh lens to make sure that we can improve 
the corporate governance in our sense is nothing but trust building with shareholders you know it's, it's been misused for a lot of times you know somebody says you know the promoter has done a trip to us he has not given information so it's not corporate governance that is not corporate governance the business has to do a lot of things which are required for the business to function and uh, what is relevant for the investor to know what is relevant for the shareholder to know if you if you are more transparent on that that is when your governance and your trust on the company will it doesn't mean i have to reveal all my competitors secrets because all my competitor has to do is buy one share and currently have all my secrets so there are certain things companies have to keep them inside to make this business competitive and for us to win in the competition to competitive marketplace we have to protect a few things that is the given so that said it could be technology it could be strategy it could be moves that we are making we have to keep certain things under under there could be legal view so there are various reasons why we have not it is not that you know we would uh, we are trying to hide anything it's just because you know you have to keep your head in the marketplace and you have to protect the business overall so what is relevant there is a list of criteria that you know exchanges and the regulators have given said you know these are the points that have to be uh, uh given information given to the end shareholder and within these time frames so for the most part we have there are i think a few lap lapses that have happened which were beyond our control including you know a lot bonus issue and had some challenges but you know there is absolutely no malified intention it just happened due to process delay which we explain and i think a lot of shareholders have understood so there is obviously there are there is always a reason for somebody to hate you or somebody to love you so that i'm not going to fight i'm just going to do what is right as a business we will go ahead and absolutely you can see for yourself in the next four years how much the corporate governance will improve we uh, we have specific teams who are looking at what is the timeline where did we go wrong just doing some sort of a, you know looking back at in the past as well this has been our approach to corporate governance and your point regarding you know whether uh, this is audited by this firm or that firm all those things will come into play and uh, we have been providing all the information you know, in fact if you seen our annual report that came out uh just a few days ago it has all the information that has been requested by shareholders and kindly go through it and if there are things that we can improve upon it we would be happy to do that thank you sir next question comes from vidya shankar an individual investor please go ahead good evening vtt team very glad to be part of this call and uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, thank you call, sir uh, this all got initiated for basically two things one was the media mill thing and before that this forensic audit thing was also on our head it was causing a lot of uh, negative things and concern in the minds of stakeholders yes. so uh, broadly speaking can we have a road map and a tentative timeline when you think you can get this forensic audit out of the window and by when you can give us a road map of the reverse strategic alliance with media mint or maybe you are looking for an alternative to media mint to boost your business at the least cost basis uh, best return option i am just thinking aloud i mean uh, maybe you are thinking of some other option that is why this was this got dropped it didn't fit no, your category no, no, I... sorry. sorry to include i did not say we are we have changed the relationship from full acquisition to an alliance we will we will work with media mint we are not we are not going away from it it's just the way we work has changed so i just want to clarify media mint is the partner only the uh, modality is changing yes sir that's it. that's it. that's it. correct so, so the road map and the timeline road map and the timeline for this uh, reworking mm-hmm. and the road map and the timeline for forensic audit to get out of the uh, like get the get the monkey out of our back like we have the idea thank for you, it so that we can go but but any more questions or you done no 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 that's the best one okay okay the first question about forensic audit like i mentioned before this is not a project forensic audit is not a project run by by com kindly understand 
i don't run the forensic audit i am just answering questions where a forensic audit is conducted by a third party by a regulator by whoever else. so we have done our part as i said in the last call as well we are waiting for whatever is the outcome from our side we are done and we feel we have done a good job we also are very confident because there is no wrong doing that's our, that's what i said and that's what there is nothing more i can do if it takes Uh, you know one day or one week whatever time it takes i don't have control it's not me who is doing it it is not my project it is somebody else's project to him to whom i am giving so i really cannot answer the first question sir the second question in terms of timeline when do you plan to get uh, you know involved with uh, the alliance with media yeah so this is again as we do position it is not something that is driven that i have to do tomorrow as our need for back end requirement increases we will continue to use them as a good option for example let us say we did this audio acquisition company uh, audio you know advertising company for acquisition and that would require us to suddenly scale say 40 50 people we would go to media mid and say give us this team we would need this team this is how this are the broad parameters of it and that's where it will start i don't want to set a timeline and say i'll do by then why would i do it unless i need this is an expense and i'm it's going to cost me to get those people out but the relationship is frozen now now i'm going to say when i need i will go to them then i do let us say i get a new i new contract from uh, uh an advertising house in uh, say uk and they need they need a huge amount of work to be done and my team or my platform require a lot of additional hands i will go to media and say please provide this hand so that is just that's the relationship we are forming now that's the alliance i'm talking about okay so there is no timeline per se it is more on need based now the relationship has transformed from being buying all their shares and holding them and telling them what to do now it has become an alliance where i will give them business they will provide me the service it becomes a, an alliance where we together work for enhancing both our values i hope i've answered your question thank you sir hello okay thank you next question comes from akash kar from value drive please go ahead Yeah, I work from London. My most of the questions have yeah, work from Indonesia. As my most of the questions have been uh, already asked by the uh, investors. This was one question which is remaining. That uh, the Gagcom has given two bonuses uh, back to back in last two years. So yeah, I, I just wanted to know uh, that uh, what was the purpose of uh, this because this. But the the market has them. It has to bring a lot of floating shares in the market, which uh, most of the uh, operators are using that leverage uh, uh, to uh, to bring the prices that to fluctuate the prices. So just wanted to know what was the purpose of the back to giving back to that bonus. Okay, fine. Good question. I think I I have explained to. Uh, to the shareholder community to the bright form family at, the, at that time as well the the basic idea of increasing the of giving bonus is to enhance okay, one is of course it's a it's a gift back to the shareholders for you know being with us for so many years i believe that if it, if the stock is more widely held while there will be an initial pick up i know you are going through the pain all of us are going through that oh what's going here and there but the number of shareholders as if it is more widely distributed it brings stability in the long run to the company so we believe that and that is the reason we did that so today yes there will be some short term issue but one year from now you will thank me for doing it because no single shareholder can come and put a gun against uh at the management or the business say so you do this otherwise i'm going to sell and hence they start driving the business that is not correct the business has to be run by the management team which is felt appropriate by the shareholders 
and if they are and then if they are performing or not performing based on that the share price should fluctuate not because some one person has control over it. so so it is always a smart idea for any business to have <clears throat> a nicely distributed share holding where no single entity or person can control that is the idea so i don't think you need to worry about you know share price or such we are doing all the things required yes, to be positioned on a global scale as a global major so you will see changes you will see initiatives that will really start bringing additional business you have seen the growth of revenue from last year to this year and we will see similar growth rate going forward if not you know as we see in our year supply and there is no reason to worry about this short term expansion of capital in fact it is going to help us where we more widely distributed among lot of other hands it's a fact so if you look at our share holding they're almost reaching i believe i think close to 3 and a half lakh share share holder uh, compared to 30000 share holder so there is absolutely nothing, no in fact you will reach a point but no group or no single person can come and uh, play with share share prices anymore okay thank you so much and thanks for your time thank you very much thank you thank you sir next question comes from sham m n sundar from geography venture please go ahead hi suresh uh, hi taisha uh, this is sham sundar material um well, most of the you. questions uh, hi um hi. hope you're all doing fine we are good we are good please go ahead okay i i don't have any question to ask you guys uh, you've been doing a fantastic a fantastic job between the last call and this call most of the questions that we had got answered the one thing that uh, you know stood out was uh, probably outreach uh, something like getting in touch uh, with the shareholders that used to be a little uh, you know too less earlier now that's picked up and i've seen a lot of updates coming in so basically what i want to tell you is please give a pat on your back now all of you from the bcg family you've been doing a good job yeah and um, thank you i think i'll remain a shareholder for the next 10 years or more thank you sir appreciate it we need people like you to support really appreciate so it. you have my entire family invested in bcg and we have a lot of uh, shares so we are really proud of what bcg is doing at this point i'm not worried about the uh, you know forensic audit we are audit we are not worried about anything else the fundamentals are strong yeah. i hope you continue to push through and uh, we should yeah. come out stronger congratulations once again thank you yeah thank you so much thank you i think you should thank you thank you sir Last question for the day comes from Ash Chaudhary from MB Advisors. Please go ahead. Ash Chaudhary from MB Advisors, please go ahead with your question. Sorry, sir, since there is no response. 